a relatively new forum and its aim is to offer doctors, nurses, clinical officers, trainers, health program managers and policy makers, NGOs and donors and TB advocates some training tools and opportunities to learn, train others and disseminate information on the clinical and programmatic management of drug resistant tuberculosis. This online training course is one of the training opportunities available through the network. The aim of the course is to provide doctors, nurses and clinical officers working in resource limited settings with basic clinical knowledge on how to initiate and treat MDRTB patients. The course consists of six webinars which will be delivered by the faculty of Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital and Partners in Health. With information future courses will be held and will explore in more in depth um, particular components of the clinical and programmatic management of uh, MDRTB and DRTB such as TB, HIV co-infection, pediatric TB, role of the community, social support and other topics. As a course director I have worked with faculty members to design the course and together we hope to meet your expectations. Today we have a presentation from Dr. Edward Nardell, Basics of Transmission Control in an Era of MDRTB Treatment. We will learn today about a basic set of infection, infection control or transmission control measures such as administrative, individual and engineering control. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Ed Nardell. He is a pulmonologist with a special interest in tuberculosis. He is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and also he has an appointment in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and also at the Harvard School of Public Health. In the early 80s, Dr. Nardell was also appointed as a medical director of tuberculosis control for the state of Massachusetts Department of Public Health, a position he held for 18 years. In 2002, he joined Parkinson Health as a director of TB research. And his research interests include the control of MDRTB in Peru, Russia, and other high burden countries, with a special research interest in airborne TB transmission and control. Dr. Nardell is currently conducting a research project in South Africa studying the transmission of MDRTB using a large number of guinea pigs to quantify the infectiousness of MDRTB patients and the effectiveness of various control interventions. So now I would like to uh, give a floor to Dr. Edward Nardell. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm pleased that so many of you were able to attend this webinar. We'll be discussing, as Alex said, uh, transmission control with a special emphasis on MDRTB. So I'm going to begin with the uh, first slide. So um, <clears throat> on this first slide, you see that I'm talking about reprioritizing uh, TB infection control. And um, what you have here is uh, a listing of the traditional uh, TB infection control components, which many of you will recognize as uh, an effort to, uh, to assess the facility. Um, is the building itself adequate for um, housing MDR-TB patients? to uh, develop a uh, TB infection control plan, including responsible personnel to generate uh, the political will and resources to actually implement TB infection control activities, which is important, uh, form a tuberculosis infection control committee. Uh, very often, most many countries will utilize the WHO TB infection control policy as a basis for local policy. Uh, and, of course, the TB infection control policy of WHO, like that of um, uh, other organizations, includes administrative environmental uh, controls and also respiratory protection. And administrative controls, which I've highlighted here, are generally said to be the least, least expensive and, and, and um, most uh, effective uh, of the um, controls that we have available. Environmental controls often generate the most interest uh, and uh, because they are uh, technical and also don't depend on human uh, behavior. 
And finally, respiratory protection is really our last ditch effort. Uh, assuming that nothing else is, is, is working perfectly, we, we then uh, offer workers uh, respirators to protect them from, from TB infection. Um, another part of t traditional TB infection control is uh, the assessment of, of the efficacy of these uh, measures, and, and this is often quite difficult to do. Um, sometimes we rely on process indicators, which is easier. That is, are people uh, opening windows, um, uh, are patients being diagnosed and treated effectively, and, and sometimes we depend on such things as cases of tuberculosis uh, among uh, healthcare workers. So these are all possible uh, ways to assess the uh, traditional infection control. Um, we're going to be focusing on administrative controls to a great deal today, although I'll, show you, I'll mention uh, some of the environmental controls and I'll mention something about respiratory protection as well. Um, the, the first administrative issue is where TB patients are treated, particularly MDR TB patients. Are they treated in the, in, in, in the, in the hospital, uh, which is where most TB patient, MDR TB patients are treated? Are they treated in an ambulatory basis in clinic, or are they treated in the community? And increasingly important, uh, how quickly are they diagnosed and placed on effective treatment? And you'll hear me uh, emphasizing over and over again the word effect effective because treatment that is not effective, that is treating MDR-TB patients with standard four drug treatment for intended for drug susceptible TB is not going to reduce infectiousness quickly whereas treatment with effective treatment will. Now as I'm sure Dr. Kashivi mentioned in the last uh, uh, webinar, there are some 500 or more MDR patients diagnosed per year, and I want to emphasize that according to WHO data, more than half of these result from transmission. That is, that they didn't develop MDR-TB in a stepwise fashion due to poor treatment, but actually developed MDR-TB as a result of inhaling bacteria that are already resistant. Now, as Dr. Kashivi also mentioned, only a small portion of patients so far have been treated according to WHO guidelines with quality control drugs and so we're really very far behind and part of the reasons for these seminars is to try and educate uh, physicians around the world and nurses uh, other healthcare workers about MDR treatment. Now as I mentioned most patients around the world are treated in hospital for the first uh, six months or so and often until culture or uh, conversion and this has resulted in some uh, aberrations, as you'll see, some some uh, uh, unusual things, um, and, and we'll be uh, I'll, I'll mention that further in a moment in uh, some experience in South Africa, but uh, it isn't the only way to treat patients. There's actually three models, not two. One of them is hospitalization, and there are many examples uh, in Russia and Belarus, uh, Georgia, South Africa, and many other places, as I mentioned, where patients are mostly treated in hospital. In, then there's non-hospitalization, and this can be clinic-based, uh, as in Nepal and many other places. And one of the st distinctions I'll make here is that often, the, of course, the staff or professional clinic staff. And then finally, uh, and this is something that Partners in Health, among others, have uh, pioneered, is the community-based treatment of MDR-TB. started in uh, 1996 in uh, Peru, uh, around the same time in Cambodia, now in Lesotho, the Philippines, and many other uh, places around the world where community-based treatment is being used. And this has... Uh, uh, one of the distinctions is it's usually by paid, not volunteers, but by paid uh, community workers, often who don't make a lot of money, but at least are uh, paid and expected to, and trained as well. Now, uh, there are many arguments for community-based MDR treatment. Uh, one of them, as you'll see in a moment, is bed availability. Um, uh, in many parts of the world, they're really are not enough hospital beds to consider hospitalizing all the patients who need to be treated for MDR-TB. 
Another is cost effectiveness of community versus hospital care. And finally, uh, there is a potential for lower transmission risk in the community, uh, both for staff and for other patients. And so I'll go through all these uh, arguments in a moment. Jumping to South Africa and a talk, a talk uh, given by the director of MDRTB in South Africa um, uh, a couple of years ago in Durban. Um, these are the various uh, regions of South Africa, the provinces, and the number of, of patients they anticipated back in 2010, and the number of available beds, and the number uh, of shortages of beds. And you see that at that time, and this is only those patients that were known to have MDRTB, not all are diagnosed, there was a defect, a deficit of almost 3,000 uh, beds. And so what's happened in South Africa is a, is a bit of a distortion. You have um, patients waiting to get into the hospital who are not on treatment. In the meantime, you have patients in the hospital who are on treatment, and I will argue very strongly uh, most of which who are not infectious anymore and really don't need to be in hospital and could be managed uh, on an outpatient basis. Uh, the cost effect of the argu uh, argument. So I'll just leave you to look at this name of the article and the authors and its uh, reference uh, up here. Uh, and um, and just mention that in this article, they compared four different MDR treatment sites, one in Tomsk and in another in Estonia. These are in the um, uh, East, Eastern Europe region of the world that are using hospitals primarily. And then the Philippines and Peru, as I mentioned, are based using community-based treatment. And you'll see here that the cost is, is quite different. Whether you measure that cost directly or as cost per uh, disability life adjusted years, uh, you see that the cost of uh, hospitalization per case is several fold higher than in community based treatment. Now, this is not a simple decision. It requires that one have developed a community based program without trained outreach workers. But it is something that people who are just starting uh, therapy uh, can aspire to and design their programs to uh, accomplish rather than just trying to build more and more hospitals, which is another approach. Uh, on the downside of hospitalization, of course, is patient to patient transmission. And you see here uh, a hospital ward made famous by the outbreak of XDRTB in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. And I won't go through the details of this. It's been well uh, publicized. But uh, the group from Yale University working here uncovered uh, extensive transmission of XDRTB among almost exclusively HIV infect co-infected persons who were occupying wards that look like this, where, as you can imagine, even despite all the windows uh, that uh, it is certainly possible for person-to-person -person transmission to occur and lots of evidence that that happened. And again, as I mentioned, more than half of MDR cases and certainly XDR patients as well result from nosocomial or hospital or healthcare center transmission. Um, speaking of uh, hospital transmission, um, Partners in Health also works in the um, uh, Oblast of Tomsk, Siberia, and we published a paper uh, a few years ago uh, cited here in the Bulletin of the World Health Organization, which looked at the origin of MDRTB in Tomsk, and much to our surprise, discovered that the biggest risk factor was MDRTB occurring among adherent patients, not non-compliant or non-adherent patients, but among adherent patients who had been hospitalized for drugs susceptible to TB and who ended up uh, being uh, diagnosed then with uh, highly drug-resistant TB, MDR-TB. So what I've had here in the box is that really what these hospitals can become are factories where patients are admitted with drug susceptible TB and reinfected with MDR-TB. And this is a very common phenomenon. I think we greatly underappreciate the importance of reinfection around the world. Um, now I'm going to stop that uh, epidemiologic uh, 
uh, approach and, and jump to the studies with uh, Alex mentioned earlier that we're doing in South Africa. Uh, here you have under the uh, graduation cap uh, a picture of a guinea pig. And this is a small rodent-like creature which happens to be extremely susceptible TB to tuberculosis. And if they breathe the air from a hospital ward, can be used to quantify the amount of TB in that air. So here we have the original experiment back in 1956 to uh, 1960 where patients were occupying a six-bed ward and all the air was taken up to a penthouse where cages were um, placed which contained um, guinea pigs which served as living quantitative air samplers for tuberculosis. Uh, here's another picture of a guinea pig uh, uh, wearing uh, glasses which is of course uh, just a joke but uh, these animals are exquisitely uh, susceptible to, to human tuberculosis more so than other animals like mice or, or rabbits and perhaps as susceptible as HIV infected humans and their immunologic response to tuberculosis is very similar. So they've been used in developing vaccines, in developing um, skin tests, for example. Uh, earlier work had shown that just one colony forming unit uh, it, it was enough to infect a guinea pig. And generally, again, guinea pigs are considered to be as susceptible as culture. Now on this very complicated diagram, which I won't spend a lot of time in, I've put all together the whole propagation of tuberculosis from an infectious source who's coughing and you see a cloud of, of droplets that are being generated into the air. Now normally we can't see that, uh, but the very finest of them stay suspended in the air and can, some of them may contain organisms which make their way through the air to others who are breathing the air and it gets into the airways and into the very distal parts of the lung pictured here and ultimately cause uh, tuberculosis. So as we know uh, tuberculosis has to get from one person to another person and it does so through the airborne route almost exclusively. Now I just will mention this in passing but we do not worry about large um, particles so dust and surfaces are not a concern with tuberculosis transmission, it must be very fine particles that remain suspended in air and are tiny enough uh, to reach the very distal part of the lung where they infect the alveolar macrophage. So airborne transmission. And these are all the factors. And I just show this slide to say that in our model where we have real patients with MDRTB uh, hospitalized and all the air being breathed by uh, highly susceptible guinea pigs, we have recreated the propagation cycle of tuberculosis and we're able to study uh, how this happens and uh, what interventions might be helpful. So this is our facility in South Africa. You see this is a wing of an MDR treatment facility. Um, it has three two bedrooms. Um, of course there's many other rooms in the hospital but this is our experimental facility and there's a nursing station and a common room and uh, all of the air from this uh, area is ventilated to from these patient rooms to these guinea pig chambers and here you see the cages in those chambers that contain uh, up to 360 guinea pigs we often don't use that many but that's how many can be there this is our team working in South Africa that do these studies and the first study we did was a environmental intervention upper room germicidal UV and here you see just for the sake of um, demonstration three different uh, fixtures one on a wall one in the center of the room one in a corner that generate a fairly narrow beam of germicidal UV germicidal irradiation that is used to disinfect the air in the lower room and this these rooms can be occupied and are occupied by patients and healthcare workers and it can be done so safely because they're not being exposed to this UV uh, very much at all which is confined to the upper room however organisms that are generated by these patients make their way into the upper room and are disinfected as they cross through this barrier and come down as sterilized air so this is one form of air disinfection now um, one of my, uh, one of the first studies we did was again to turn this UV uh, GI, ultraviolet air disinfection, on and off every other day in the wards. And on the days it was off, 
the air was going to this guinea pig colony, and at the day, uh, I'm sorry, when the day when the intervention was on, it was going here, and when the intervention was off, it was going here. And if we compare at the end of several months uh, how many guinea pigs are infected in each of these chambers, we have a direct measure of how effective that intervention was in the rooms. And just keep this model in mind because it's the same model that we've used to test other interventions, which I'll be talking about. So uh, I'm going to ask you now, uh, first quiz, how effective do you think upper room germicidal UV was? Is it 20% effective, 50% effective, or 80% effective? And we'll ask you to, we'll take a moment to see if we can generate some responses from you. All right, so um, if we can go back to the presentation. There seemed to be quite a split vote among, among you uh, with, I think, maybe a slight majority think it's about 50% effective. The answer is 80% effective um, in, in our study. And uh, what we did was this is the UV fixtures that we studied in the upper room. The air from the patient ward, patient beds were in this room, was going into the ventilation system. There was a paddle fan on to make sure the air was well mixed. And uh, under these circumstances, uh, here's the paddle fan, by the way, and the UV fixture, and the air going into the duct. And under these circumstances, we found that there were 80% less infections. And here's that actual data. Here are the tuberculin skin tests in the intervention room in two consecutive studies. We found no infections among the guinea pigs in that first study, and then a total of 15 in the second study. And in, in the control arm, in the days when there was no UV on, um, we see that there were many more infections. In fact, um, you know, there was about an 80% efficacy, five times the risk of getting infected uh, for the guinea pigs breathing air on the days when the UV was um, uh, off. So uh, these conclusions together with similar data from Rod Escom, who did a similar study in Peru and found 72% efficacy, provides strong evidence that properly applied, and I want to emphasize properly applied, upper room UV can be highly effective in preventing TB transmission in real world settings. Future studies will better define the conditions required for highly effective UV. And some of the real barriers to using this, of course, are the um, availability of low-cost, well-designed UV fixtures built in country and local capacity for reliable planning uh, installations and maintaining them. We've seen a lot of poorly designed fixtures in many countries and a lack of understanding of how these systems work and how they should be uh, used. Moving along, uh, how about surgical masks? Um, very many countries use surgical masks on patients uh, who are coughing as a way to stop transmission. And I ask you, uh, uh, whether you think that these were 20% effective, 50% effective, or 80% effective on patients. Okay, we're getting a quite a, again, a spread of, of responses uh, of patients. And again, what we did here was exactly the same kind of study. We asked patients, they thought we were a little bit crazy, but we asked them to wear these surgical masks every other day. Uh, and the air on the days they wore them, between 7 in the morning and 7 at night, went to the one guinea pig colony, and then from 7 a.m. to 7 at night to the other guinea pig colony. And at night, we didn't ask them to wear masks, and the air didn't go to the guinea pigs. So the answer is, from this particular study, 
we found that the surgical masks on patients were in fact 50 percent effective in this study and I'll show you that data as well. Now we're talking about by the way um, surgical masks shown in the larger photo here that over the ear with uh, not attempting to fit tightly. We're, this mask is being used as a barrier. Patient coughs, the large particles are uh, impacted by the mask and not there's no mask that's manufactured that will contain the force of a cough. This is a respirator as you know it's designed to fit tightly. This is designed to protect the wearer from infection. This is designed to protect the area, the room from becoming contaminated or the surgical field from becoming contaminated. This is what's recommended for patient use uh, in a limited basis. This is recommended for healthcare worker use. At any rate, this is what we found to be approximately 50% effective. And here's the data uh, shown horizontally this time with the intervention on, that is the patients wearing masks. There were 36 guinea pigs infected. Uh, let me just use that arrow again. Uh, there were 36 patients infected, 36 guinea pigs infected, and with no, on the days when they weren't wearing respirators, there were 69 guinea pigs infected, so approximately 53% effective in this particular study. Uh, we think it's probably realistic because, uh, again, people can't wear these things all the time and, and shouldn't be asked to wear them all the time. They're stigmatizing, and, but it's fine, I think, for a waiting room um, until you can get that patient evaluated and get them on therapy, but it's not intended for long-term use. I personally don't like to see patients discharged from facilities and given masks to take home. You can't wear these all the time, and they only work when they're being worn, so it's not something we want to do. How about air filtration machines? Sometimes you'll see these in hospitals. These are various shapes and sizes of machines that have motors and generate airflow and are either irradiate the air or uh, filter the air. How effective are those? 20%, 50%, 80% effective. Okay, so again we've had quite a spread of responses and in this case our most recent study actually showed that the machines we tested were surprisingly ineffective because we had machines which we really thought were should be more effective than this but that's what we found. We think that um, we may do the study again because they really are a little bit surprised by how ineffective they were but generally speaking for a variety of reasons uh, myself and I mean colleague uh, Dr. Paul Jensen generally dis discourage the use of all these types of machines mainly because they mostly don't move enough air uh, to provide any high levels of air disinfection in rooms. So we really discourage the use of air cleaners in general. I think they could be effective but most of them don't move enough air to be effective. So we discourage those uh, any kinds of air cleaning machines. Now finally, uh, when do MDR patients become non-infectious on therapy? Um, we, it's a very important question because some uh, programs keep MDR patients in until their smears and cultures are negative. Um, many keep them for six months and fear of transmission is often the reason for, given for doing that. So we really um, do um, I think this is an important question to answer and the answers in this case are, are very skewed. Um, everyone, almost everyone thinks that uh, most of the uh, patients need to be, will be infectious until they're smear or culture negative. Now you're going to be surprised by this answer and it need, requires some explanation but our studies found in uh, with MDR patients that almost immediately with the start of effective therapy I emphasize effective therapy. Let me say it again, effective therapy that uh, patients become uh, um, rapidly non-infectious. And it's not two weeks, which has been recommended for um, drug susceptible patients, and it certainly isn't until they become smear culture negative. Now let me tell you a bit more about that. In Richard Riley's original experiment, which I show here, uh, he showed the he came up with the following data. There were 
what's shown here is the relatively relative infectivity of patients. And back then in the 50s, he actually had some patients where he delayed treatment. And those were the most infectious. And these were drug susceptible patients. And there were also patients who were treated right away. And when I say right away, they were started on therapy the very day they went into this facility. Not two week, not after two weeks therapy, not until they were smear and culture negative, but the very day. And for drug susceptible TB, there was a 98% reduction in infectiousness on the very day, after the very day that patients came into therapy, even though they remained smear and culture negative. He also had drug-resistant patients, not as many, and so he didn't really rely very much on this data, but we're finding the same thing, that first of all, these patients seem to be less infectious. Um, that may or may not be true in the era of uh, HIV. And we've seen the outbreaks of, in KwaZulu-Natal and in New York City and other places of MDR-TB. And then uh, the impact of treatment started the very day that they went into the facility was, again, a, a fairly dramatic and uh, rapid reduction in infectivity. We're finding the same thing in our facility. We haven't published it yet for a variety of reasons. We've just received some funding to, uh, uh, to uh, make a more detailed study of this, but we believe that when patients are started on therapy that includes fluoroquinolones and injectables, and they're susceptible to those drugs, that they rapidly, rapidly become non-infectious, even though the smearing culture may stay positive. The problem is that many patients don't know, uh, we don't know that they what their drug susceptibility is, and so you can't count on treatment being effective if you don't know that they are drug susceptible. The rationale for this is that when particles are formed, they contain drug that's in the respiratory secretions, and as the droplets evaporate, the drug doesn't evaporate, and the concentration may go very, very high in particles, resulting in less infectiousness. I'm going to hurry up here because I want to finish in time for lots of questions. Uh, these are some of the patients that we've put through our facility. There's been 125 patients already now. They're admitted with smear positive, cavitary, they're coughing, and they're recently started on therapy, usually meaning they're started on therapy the day they go into the facility, just like Dr. Riley found. And you can see, like the patients you have, they have advanced disease, many of them are HIV positive, and uh, are very similar to the ones you're probably seeing. So the conclusion of this work is that, <clears throat> in general, and this has been well known for years, on a general medical ward, orthopedic ward, obstetrics ward, psychiatric ward, it's the patient with unsuspected tuberculosis drug susceptible or drug resistant that's going to be most infectious. We spend all of our time worrying about patients in, who we know have TB and what mask or they should wear or what respirator healthcare workers should wear. But in fact, it's the undiagnosed patient that's causing the most problems and there, nobody's going to be wearing any respirator protection or using uh, environmental controls under those pa for those patients. For the TB hospital, and this is, for example, our hospital in Tomsk. It's the patient with unsuspected MDRTB uh, or XDRTB that is going to be still contagious because they're being treated for drug susceptible TB and not being treated for uh, drug resistant TB. So the ones that are being treated for drug susceptible TB that are drug susceptible will rapidly become non-infectious. These patients will remain drug resistant and so we need to be able to diagnose them rapidly. Uh, just to, in passing, I'm not going to spend time on this, but another colleague in, in Peru, Rod Escom, also found that of the many guinea pigs that were infected in his facility, very similar facility, that almost all of them were due to MDR patients when everyone was being treated for drug susceptible TB. So again, suggesting that treatment stops transmission very effectively uh, if there is, if it is effective treatment. Uh, so all of this we've translated into a, a kind of a new approach to TB infection control that we're calling FAST, finding TB cases by rapid diagnostics so that we don't have undiagnosed patients on the ward. And of course, the current rapid diagnostic is gene expert when that becomes available, but an old diagnostic can also be rapid. Sputum smear can have a rapid turnaround time. And but it doesn't tell you anything about drug susceptibility. But if you don't have much drug susceptibility, sputum smear can be a way to find coughing uh, TB in coughing patients. So active case finding, 
cough surveillance on all entrance points into clinics and hospitals it should be a goal of, of your program. If you find coughing patients, get sputum, and do a rapid diagnosis. And then temporarily, because it does take a little time, you may want to separate these patients and to use cough reduction, uh, exposure reduction techniques such as ventilation, natural or mechanical, ultraviolet, masks on patients, all the things you'll find in the guidelines can be used to reduce transmission. But most importantly is to get people on rapid therapy based on a rapid drug, drug susceptibility test focused on rapid molecular testing. Just about over and we'll have time for questions. So if we look at this list of uh, traditional TB infection control um, interventions that I mentioned early, they're all important. But what we're focusing on here is administrative controls, in particular, the need to, uh, to sur survey patients for cough and to get them rapidly diagnosed and on effective therapy. And this is based on our own findings and those that come from as, as long as 50 years ago that there is nothing more effective than effective treatment in stopping transmission of TB. So even though we focused a lot on environmental controls and on respiratory protection, treatment and diagnosis of cases is by far the most important thing to do. So in summary, last slide, there is not enough, there are not enough hospital beds uh, around in the world to treat all the TB patients in the world. And one really be, needs to think about uh, community-based treatment, but that requires training and, uh, and a program to be able to do that well. It can be done well, and it can be cost-effective and highly effective. Hospitalization is more expensive and really not necessary. I've shown you that upper room germicidal UV and surgical masks can be highly effective, but not nearly as effective as an administrative approach. Uh, I've shown you that we filtration machines, uh, air cleaners, are, are not recommended generally because of many, many limitations, which I haven't had time to go to. And finally, I've shown you that the transmission risk in the community, clinic, and hospital can all be profoundly uh, reduced by the FAST approach, which is really active case finding followed by DST-guided effective treatment. And I think that is my last slide, and I'm happy to begin to try and address these questions that I'm sure you have. Um, Can I elaborate more? The first question I see here is, can I elaborate uh, more about process indicators? So for process indicators, with particularly administrative controls, we're talking about, for example, um, uh, how long does it take for a coughing patient to be recognized from the time of admission? Once recognized, how long does it take to get a sputum sample from that patient? How long does it take to get that sputum specimen to the laboratory? How long does it take to get the, um, um, the results back from the sputum lab or from the gene expert machine? And ultimately, how long does it take to get people on effective therapy based on a DST? So these are all things that can be measured and, and, and should be measured as a way to uh, talk about um, um, uh, in, in terms of administrative control indicators. Uh, so that's what I mean about process indicators. Um, when are patients considered to be no more infectious to other patients after the start of treatment for MDR-TB? So that's a complicated question. I've just told you that with effective therapy in Dr. Riley's experience and in our own experience, it seems to happen very, very quickly. Um, in Dr. Riley's experience, I would say within 24 hours. Uh, with, with drug resistant and drug susceptible TB. There was no such thing as MDR TB back then, but remember that in the 50s and 60s, the only drugs they had were INH, streptomycin, and PAS. So if you're, res if you're drug resistant to them, you had really um, something more equivalent to XDR TB, as we call it today. In other words, there were very few effective treatments, and yet those treatments seem to stop transmission as well. Our own studies show, for example, we had one experiment where we had, th for three months, 27 patients who were smear positive cafeteria and coughing, none, and there was no XDRTB in that population, and one guinea pig was infected over three months out of, uh, out of 90. 
uh, other experiments where there are XDRTB that was not recognized at the beginning uh, were much less, much more infectious. I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that MDR patients are not infectious after you start therapy. I'm saying that MDR therapy patients uh, will become rapidly non-infectious when they're on effective therapy. And effective therapy means treatment with uh, uh, drugs to which we know patients are uh, susceptible. How can we overcome the fears and stigma related to, to drug-resistant TB, sometimes fueled by inappropriate media reports to effectively manage TBR, uh, drug-resistant TB in the community? Well, um, you know, again, we can look to communities where this has happened in the Philippines, in, in uh, Lesotho, in Cambodia, and in Peru. It is possible to, for patients to accept the fact that patients on therapy uh, are no longer infectious. Remember that these same, very same patients have been in the community for weeks and months with symptoms before they're diagnosed, and that's when most transmission occurs. And once they are diagnosed, they treatment becomes um, uh, rapidly um, um, uh, not, they become rapidly non-infectious. Um, regarding humidity, what percentage of humidity does TB, does TB, is TB more infectious? Um, there's very little information known about the impact of humidity on TB transmission and I really don't have anything to say about it. Um, there is no, there is information about the impact of humidity on ultraviolet air disinfection, which suggests that it, it is less effective in high humidity, but we don't really have definitive studies on that either. Uh, in, in, in Rod Escom's study in Peru, there was a range of humidity, and he still found 72% efficacy over several years. So I think, um, you know, it's an unanswered question, the impact of humidity on transmission. Uh, how is in, influence, uh, transmission influenced by the amount of time spent in the ward? Is infection a function of time spent and how? Well, yes. Uh, risk of transmission is directly a function of the exposure time. And that is because it's a probability of inhaling an infectious dose or sometimes even more than one infectious dose. And that will increase uh, dependent on how much time is spent in the ward. So I think in every study that's been done, uh, duration of exposure is a, um, uh, a huge determinant of rates of transmission. Now, if people are in effective therapy, however, you can have a prolonged exposure, and that will not increase the risk because the patients aren't infectious. So it's only one of the factors. Uh, treatment is a very important one. On average, how long after commencement of treatment does it take to revert a non -infectious, to a non-infectious status for both a drug susceptible and MDR-TB? Well, I've answered this again uh, over uh, several times, but I will just mention again, for drug susceptible TB, Dr. Riley's data is very clear that patients became non-infectious at the time they entered the facility, regardless of uh, drug, uh, rather smear and culture. Uh, positivity if they were drug susceptible and on, on good treatment. For drug resistant TB, we're finding the same thing. It's not published yet, but it appears to be very quick. Um, let me find the next question. Um, please elaborate about environmental factors affecting transmission. Um, well, again, uh, the most important environmental factors, I would say, is the air turnover rate, that is the number of air changes in the room where a susceptible person and a, uh, a source are sharing the same air. One of the most effective ways to reduce transmission apart from treatment is to um, uh, change that air over. And natural ventilation can do that if conditions are right. Mechanical ventilation can do that if it's well planned and, and, and functioning, meaning maintained. Upper room ultraviolet light can do that if it's properly installed and maintained. Uh, so there are many ways to do it, but that's the most important environmental factor. Crowding is another factor. If you have one patient who is infectious and you know 20 patients on a ward, the exposure is greater than if there's one patient in a room by himself or one patient with two other patients in the room. So crowding and shared space is another environmental factor. Um, what is the effect of sunlight in TB infection control? What, what's, 
and I would say again, we believe it or not, sunlight is not exactly the optimal wavelength for killing TB organisms. It's it's actually too long. It um, but it probably is effective in, in in strong sunlight outside. But more important outside is dilution. Uh, that occurs outside, um, so it's very. We think it's very difficult for patients to infect one another outside. Sunlight may be somewhat effective. There's not a lot of data on it. Inside, sunlight is probably not very effective. Um, it, you lose a lot of uh, the effective kinds of UV going through glass, and so um, you know it's not. You can't rely on it, and of course, it doesn't work at night. Um, says, if patients are smear negative but eventually found out to be culture positive, what is the risk of transmitting to be the healthcare workers who handle the patient? How does duration of patient contact affect transmission, specific duration of time? Okay, so again, uh, first of all, um, there has been um, evidence that smear negative patients can transmit, but they're generally felt to be less infectious than smear positive patients. Smear positivity is an index of how many organisms are in the sputum and, and how many are being aerosolized when patients cough. Duration of contact is a direct function, but you can't put a number on it. You, can say you're fi you can't say you're fine for a half hour and that at two hours suddenly you're not fine in terms of risk. The reason being is that every patient is different in terms of their, uh, the numbers of organisms they're generating and the infectiousness of those organisms. So, you really cannot say there is a certain time limit uh, under which um, there is no risk of transmission. There is an occasional you know, intern or medical student who gets infected with the very first patient they see with TB and others who work most of their career and don't get infected. And of course, host resistance is another factor. So I can't put a number on it for you, but I can tell you that the longer the duration, the greater the risk of transmission. Uh, that's why healthcare workers use respirators because surgical masks are not 100% effective. Yes and no. Uh, again, a respirator and a surgical mask are intended to do different things. A surgical mask is intended to stop large particles from ending up on a surgical field. It also effectively stops some large particles, about half it appears, uh, from becoming small particles that can transmit. Um, 50% reduction is not useless uh, for, I mean, to get the same benefit, you'd have to double ventilation, for example, or, you know, treat half the patients. Anything you can think of that would reduce risk by half is what happens when you wear a surgical mask uh, for short periods of time for patients who are infectious. For, for, for healthcare workers, however, we're trying to stop the majority of air from entering the lungs. And to do that, you need a tight-fitting mask. Uh, I'm sorry, a tight-fitting respirator. Um, again, mask is reserved for surgical type loose-fitting. Respirator means tight-fitting, um, usually with two rubber bands and certified as a respirator. Those aren't 100% effective either. They're usually no more than 80% effective. So the difference is not all that huge, 50%, 80%. But, and the reason being is that there's always some face seal leak, face seal leak around that respirator. So it's not 100% effective. There's usually 10, 15, as much as 20% face seal leak. How often should surgical mask on patients be changed? Um, that's, um, we don't have any definite information, but when they get wet and uncomfortable, they should probably be changed, but they shouldn't be wearing them for long periods of time. We did this for this study only. We think that surgical masks belong on patients only, for example, while waiting in a crowded waiting room or maybe in a, being transported. But for long-term use, diagnosis and effective treatment is going to be much better. And masks are just too stigmatizing and uncomfortable. They certainly can't wear them all the time. You can't wear them when they're sleeping. can't wear them when they're eating. And you shouldn't ask patients to wear them that long. So they shouldn't have to be changed very often because they're really intended for short-term use. Uh, is the machine that has HEPA filter with it? Um, so um, I think what they're asking is 
these air cleaning machines. They can have HEPA filters, they can have UV, they can have UV and HEPA filters. The problem with them is not what's killing the organisms or stopping the organism. The problem is with how much air they're turning over. And many of these machines do not turn over a significant amount of air to achieve the 10, 15 uh, air changes per hour that is necessary to really uh, have um, uh, enough air disinfection to be meaningful, uh, similar to outdoor ventilation or what you can accomplish with upper room UVGI, which is in the range of 10 to 20 air changes per hour. Uh, is that all our questions? Oh, I'm sorry, we have more questions. Um, let's see. Should outpatient waiting rooms have UV as well? Um, I think it's a very appropriate place for, for uh, upper room UVGI if it's well planned, if the, if the fixtures are properly designed, and if uh, depending what the alternatives are. If you have an outdoor waiting area uh, and there's some air movement, you probably don't need UVGI and it's probably much more cost effective to have an outdoor waiting area in parts of the world where that's possible. However, if your clinic is in Siberia where we work, you probably can't have an outdoor waiting area and you're not going to have open windows in that waiting area for much of the year. So you need to have some rapid air turnover and upper room UVGI with mixing fans. I want to emphasize the importance of mixing fans uh, uh, can be highly effective. Um, Effective therapy means any specific combination of medication? No, effective therapy means the, recomm the, the, the regimens recommended by the WHO guidelines based on drug susceptibility results. If you, uh, what happens very often in many hospitals is patients admitted started on the standard four drug regimen and then you find out only four months later that they are actually drug resistant. In that four-month period, while you're waiting for those results, those patients are infectious and need to have other invention, infection control um, interventions. The goal would be to speed that process up by uh, ultimately rapid diagnostics that will allow you to diagnose MDR treatment faster. I realize that most of you don't have that at this time, but many places are getting it. It is in the future, and it may be in the near future, uh, depending on where you work, et cetera, that you can diagnose MDR-TB quickly. Um, given that many countries have limited resources to address TBIC strategies, what would you suggest as the most country programs put their efforts? Well, I think I'll echo what, what the guidelines from WHO say, that administrative controls are the probably the most important. And among the administrative controls that are available, uh, cough surveillance, rapid diagnosis and effective treatment are by far and away the most important thing that should be done. Um, how do they conduct the uh, tests for infect infectious of MDR treatments within 24 hours of treatment? Again, these were, uh, these were the guinea pig studies that we've mentioned. Again, we haven't published this yet, so uh, and we will, and we've been just funded to do more studies on this. Uh, but it's a matter of the fact that when patients in our hands and patients who are on have MDR TB treatment who are on MDR therapy, those patients don't treat, transmit from the beginning, and those patients who are on MDR treatment who have XDR TB continue to transmit. That's what I'm referring to. Um, what is the evidence are uh, the current recommendations for IC and low E in the, in the countries? The evidence is all in those documents. It's been reviewed carefully. Go to the WHO documents. I think I'm out of time, and I wish I could get through the last few questions, but uh, we are through most of them. Um, uh, we are to an end. I would like to sincerely thank Dr. Nardell for a very informative and very interesting presentation and webinar. And I would also like to thank you all for your participation. I hope you all agree that it was very